coming up on News Center this Monday night. Partial cabinet reshuffle. The Korean leader replaces her minister in charge of economic affairs in a revamp affecting five ministers. Former co chairman of Korea's main opposition party will launch a new political party by early February for April's general elections. But out of the question is joining hands with the NPAD. And gasoline is cheap, so cheap that a liter of gas costs less than a liter of soda here in Korea. In the U.S., it costs more to buy milk than filling up your gas tank. News Center begins right now. Good evening to our viewers in Korea and hello to those around the world. This is News Center. Now, in fewer than four months' time, and this country heads to the polls for the general elections. That said, uh, on this Monday, President Park Geun-hye executed a highly anticipated cabinet reshuffle. She replaced her minister in charge of economic affairs and for others. Who did the Korean leader choose to bring on board her administration going into the fourth year of her term? And can we read between the lines? Our presidential office correspondent Song Ji-san joins us from the top office. Now, Ji-san, this, uh, this reshuffle, it's what we've been anticipating for the past few weeks with the general elections nearing by the day. Kanyang time was running out and the president could not afford to wait another day. There was no progress being made at the National Assembly on bills aimed at reviving the economy, with pending issues piling up for government officials and a handful already preparing to step down to run in next year's general election. President Park Geun-hye on Monday announced a cabinet reshuffle involving five ministries and one agency. She tapped former Transportation Minister Yu il ho for new Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister. The presidential office says that Yu, an experienced bureaucrat, will help revitalize the economy with his expertise and carry out reforms that the government has been pushing for. Yu said he will maintain policy direction consistent with his predecessor Choi kyung hwan but will first have to undergo a parliamentary confirmation hearing. Vice Finance Minister Chu hyung hwan was promoted to Minister of Trade, Industry and Energy, with current Trade Minister Yoon Sang-jik expected running next year's general election. Yi jun sik an engineering professor with more than 20 years of teaching experience was named Deputy Prime Minister for Social Affairs and Minister of Education. Hong Yun sik from the Office for Government Policy Coordination at Prime Minister Secretariat, was named Minister of the Interior. Ruling party lawmaker Kang Eun Hee was chosen to lead the Minister of Gender Equality and Family. Kang, a teacher turned entrepreneur, also served as spokesperson of the Senuri Party and is expected to facilitate employment of women. President Park also selected lawyer Chong Young hoon to lead Korea's Anti-Corruption and Civil Rights Commission. Overall, the president opted to appoint officials with proven track records and experience in their respective fields that will be able to assist her as she enters her fourth year in office. The new cabinet members will get right down to business to wrap up the year and prepare for next year's plan. Kon Young. Well, uh, the nominees, of course, must go through parliamentary confirmation hearings, although they are not subject to parliamentary approval. Our Song Ji-sun from the nation's top office. Thank you, Ji-sun. Now, An Choi Su, former co-leader and co-founder of Korea's main opposition party, the New Politics Alliance for Democracy, has unveiled a plan to launch a new political party of his own by early February next year with April's general election in mind. Now, An, who called it quits with the NPAD earlier this month, held a press conference today. Our parliamentary correspondent, Ji Myung-gil, joins me from the National Assembly. Now, myung what did the ex-main opposition party leader have to say? Good evening, Kon Young. An Cheol Su, now an independent who defected from the New Politics Alliance for Democracy Party, earlier this month said Monday that his new party will have two main priorities. The new party will focus on improving people's livelihoods and strive to replace the current administration by winning the next presidential election for the sake of Korea's future. 
and said he was recruiting members who will help him form a new opposition force and have specific details worked out before February, as a preparatory committee will be launched early next year. He stressed that the new party will be at the forefront of political reform and will also join hands with groups with differing views and ideologies. The new party will not be my personal party. I will form coalitions with various members of society. The new party will offer hope, not give in to vested interests, and strive for political unity. And added that he is open to joining hands with former MPD lawmakers, but not with the MPD itself, which is undergoing an internal power struggle among different factions. The ruling's Henry Party criticized Anne's move, saying it does not benefit the opposition bloc and remains wary of the political move. The business tycoon turned politician left the party earlier this month after the current MPD chief Moon Jae-in refused Ahn's proposal to hold a party convention to elect a new leader. With Ahn now officially launching a new political party, it looks like change in the political landscape is on the horizon for Korea in the run-up to the general election slated for April. Kon Young. Well, definitely. So um, we'll all be closely watching how the latest series of events will impact election results come April. That was our parliamentary correspondent, Ji Myung Gil. Thank you, Myung Gil, for that. Now, before you pop open that can of soda, you might want to think again. You might as well fill your gas tank with that money you just spent on beverage. A liter of gasoline is now cheaper than a liter of soda. Now, you might think, wow, a huge drop in oil price. But the money you save doesn't do justice to the overall slump in global oil prices. Our Kim min -ji explains why consumers here in Korea don't save as much on gas as they, they probably should. A prolonged decline in global oil prices has pushed down prices at the pump. But here in Korea, they haven't been falling as quickly as local drivers would like. According to the Korean National Oil Corporation, the average price of gasoline for December stood at around $1.22 per liter, down 38 cents compared to last year. But here's the catch. In the same period, Dubai crude prices, which account for a majority of Korea's imports, dropped to about $35 a barrel this month from over $60 a year ago. Simply put, while global oil prices fell by more than 40 percent, gasoline in Korea dropped by just over 10 percent. So why the big difference? Experts point to a string of taxes levied on fuel. Before tax, gasoline is currently priced at just over 500 won, or roughly 40 cents per liter, which means it's cheaper than bottled water. X-factory prices of gasoline have indeed fallen in line with global crude prices, but local consumers face transportation, road and education taxes, as well as a 10 percent value-added tax. Together, they make up about 60 percent of the final price. Since the tax is fixed, benefits from a drop in oil prices don't really show up for the consumer. In addition, gasoline in circulation in Korea is based on higher prices as it was bought and refined 93 days ago. Some experts have voiced the need for structural changes. There's a need to make the tax more elastic. When global oil prices go up, that means low-income households will be hit hard. So there should be different regulations for different income groups. But such changes won't be easy. Although critics have called for lower oil taxes, the government is unwilling to budge on what is a stable source of tax revenue, especially at a time when prices are so low. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Korea's skyrocketing household debt is in news. It's something we've almost become accustomed to. Well, another record has been set on that front. Latest data shows the country's average household debt has topped 52,000 U.S. dollars for the first time ever. And the debt to disposable income ratio over 110 percent. Our Shin Se-min has a thorough breakdown of the numbers. The burden on Korean borrowers continues to surge, riding on the ever-increasing household debt that surpassed 1,000 trillion won, or 989 billion U.S. dollars in the third quarter. 
as of March this year, the average Korean household was in the red by over $52,000, up 2.2 percent compared to the same period last year. Data by the Bank of Korea, Statistics Korea, and the Financial Supervisory Service show that the increase is a result of more high-income earners purchasing homes on the back of cheaper borrowing costs. Overall, Koreans' income, along with their annual disposable income, rose, while the amount they borrowed also went up. As the burden of paying back principal and interest expand, more Koreans have also been putting their income towards some money they borrowed, about a quarter of their earnings. Now the financial debt to disposable income ratio stands at over 110 percent, the highest since the data was first collected in 2012. Breaking it down by age, those in their 50s accounted for the least increase, with their debt figure dropping 1.4 percent on year. Households with family members in their 30s and 40s have 68 and 70 percent debt, while those in their 60s or older have nearly half of that amount. The data also shows that those in their 60s and older posted the biggest increase, an indication that the growing population of Korea's silver citizens are becoming more economically active. According to the data, 64 percent of all Koreans are indebted, marking a drop of 1.6 percent. But the scale of the total median household debt spiked over 11 percent to $37,000, highlighting Korea's snowballing household debt, which posted the fastest growth in the third quarter this year since 2002. Shin Arirang News. Samsung Biologics is looking to become the world's number one contract manufacturer in biopharmaceuticals by year 2020. Now, it's particularly set its sights on shifting the current production paradigm in the biopharma segment from self-production to outsourcing. Our Kim Hyun-bin has the latest. Samsung's Biologics revealed plans to invest $721 million in its facility in Songdo to become the largest contract manufacturing organization. President Park Geun-hye attended the groundbreaking ceremony on Monday, hosted by Samsung Group's pharmaceutical unit, Samsung Biologics, in the city of Incheon, west of Seoul. IT President Park signaled out the biohealth industry as a core component of the creative economy, which will create high-value products and high-quality jobs. The completion of the Songdo facility alone is expected to produce 180,000 liters annually, surpassing that of Switzerland's Lanza Group and Germany's Beringer Ingelheim. If a third facility is completed by 2020, Samsung Biologics will be the world's leading CMO and become number one in terms of sales and profit. Samsung Biologics expects the global CMO market to reach $7.2 billion in 2017, which is an annual growth of 9.4 percent. A drastic increase considering the global CMO market was $4.6 billion in 2012. The company's capacity will double to 360,000 liters after its third plant is completed in 2018, as Samsung is vying to become the world's top manufacturer by 2020. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Rescue workers are searching for dozens of missing people in a massive landslide in southern China. Now, on Sunday, a mound of earth and other construction debris slammed into an industrial park in Shenzhen. Bruce Harrison is live in the studio with me. Uh, Bruce, tell us how the uh, search and rescue operations are progressing there. Okay, good evening, Kang Yang. Right now, uh, around 90 people are still believed to be missing. Uh, they say roughly a dozen have been rescued. There were some serious injuries. Uh, the mudslide buried 33 buildings. That included some dormitories, and more than 900 people had to be evacuated. So responders have been setting up temporary housing for those people in the meantime.
Well, Bruce, uh, the landslide is far from being the first uh, accident of its kind in China's industrial sites, and it raises the questions of whether there is enough safety measures in the industrial sites there. Sure. Well, in this case, the government's already said that the uh, construction waste was stacked too steeply, and that's what led to its collapse. Uh, so we already know lax safety regulations possibly played a role in this disaster. Now, just four months ago, a chemical warehouse blew up and killed 160 people in the port city of Tianjin. Chinese officials have yet to say if anyone died in the landslide over the weekend, though several people were seriously hurt. We have used 78 excavators to carry out massive digging from different directions along with rescuers so as not to miss any possibilities. In 2010, a landslide killed more than 1,500 people in northwestern China following heavy rains. Experts in Shenzhen said it's likely there will be no more landslides at the industrial park. The disaster could have been much worse as the landslide caused a natural gas pipeline to explode. Workers have already emptied that gas pipe and are preparing to lay a temporary pipeline. FIFA has banned suspended President Sapp Blatter for eight years amid the largest corruption scandal in the history of the global soccer organization. Blatter was banned along with European soccer boss Michel Platini for ethics violations. The two were investigated after FIFA paid Platini two million U.S. dollars in 2011 with Blatter's approval. FIFA's ethics committee said it was unable to find evidence the payment was a bribe, but said it lacked transparency and presented a conflict of interest. Blatter said he plans to appeal the ban. Eight years. But I will fight. <coughs> I will fight for me and I will fight for FIFA. Suspended eight years for what? Blatter served as the head of FIFA for 17 years and Platini led the Union of European Football Associations before he was suspended over the FIFA scandal. Platini said his ban's a political ploy to keep him from seeking the FIFA presidency. Now, Bruce, a young Colombian woman was um, <clears throat> excuse me, crowned the winner of one of uh, the world's largest beauty contests just for a moment. Um, it turns out the host, I guess, the sh of the show announced the wrong Miss Universe. I mean, imagine the devastation by the, um, the Colombian runner. Sure, devastation for the Colombian, but relief for the, the winner who is from the Philippines. You know, this looks like it was really just a simple mistake. Uh, host Steve Farvey read the wrong card, which said the contestant from Colombia was the first runner-up not the winner. Runner up. It was my mistake. It was on the card. Horrible mistake, but the right thing, I can show it to you right here. The first runner up is Colombia. After that, Ariada Aravela was forced to remove the crown and give it to Miss Philippines via Alonzo Wurzbach. Well, Bruce, it is one thing to be announced the runner-up to uh, of a Miss uh, Universe, but quite another to be stripped off of the crown after being announced the winner. I can't imagine the feeling, and like I said, host Steve Harvey acknowledged the mistake. He went on Twitter afterwards where he's getting destroyed, but he did say it was actually an error with the teleprompter. So, um, but he did have a card in his hand right. as well. And, and he said it was an honest mistake, and let's believe him. We'll All see right. what happens to his career. Sure. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for today, and um, we'll see you tomorrow. My pleasure. Another South Korean national has been shot dead in the Philippines. It's the 11th murder case of a South Korean living in the Southeast Asian country this year. No word yet on a motive for the murder, but for the first time ever. Korean police is dispatching four of its own officials to the Philippines to investigate the case. Our foreign affairs correspondent Hun Soa reports. It's already the 11th South Korean murdered this year in the Philippines. The Korean embassy said a 57-year-old man surnamed Cho was shot dead by four armed strangers at around 1.30 a.m. on Sunday local time. They reportedly broke into his house in Malvar, a city in the province of Batangas, south of Manila, while he was asleep with his wife and child. The two were unharmed. What's known so far is that Zhou worked in the construction industry, and according to residents, he was in the midst of going through a divorce process.
The victim had filed for divorce. The ruling was supposed to come out in January. After that, he would have had no more responsibility of giving money to his ex-wife. To find the motive for the murder, along with Filipino law enforcement, a Korean team of three policemen and one forensic expert will be involved in the investigation, marking the first time ever Korean police is involved in a case abroad. Local police are in charge of crimes that happen in their jurisdiction, but allowing Korean police to take part shows how bilateral cooperation has advanced. The Philippine National Police seem to be acknowledging the need for Korea's prowess in scientific investigations. This comes after Korean and Philippine police chiefs agreed last month on dispatching Korean investigators whenever Koreans become the target of crimes such as murder, rape and robbery. 39 Koreans were murdered in the Philippines in the past four years. Experts say the most explainable reasons for such crimes are that Koreans in the Philippines own a lot of cash and loose gun possession laws in the country. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. High school students in California may start learning about Imperial Japan's enforcement of women to sex slavery before and during World War II. In a draft framework for the state's 2017 public school curriculum, the California Department of Education has proposed to add the topic in its history and social science lessons. Now, if adopted, it will be the first time the issue has been included in the American school education. Our Kwon Jang Ho brings us the details. The California Department of Education has proposed teaching its high school students about the issue of Japan's wartime sexual slavery. Not... Using the phrase comfort women to describe the victims, it's included in the draft framework of history and social sciences for students in grade 10, aged 15 to 16. In chapter 15 of the draft, entitled World History, Culture and Geography, The Modern World, it says the issue is to be taught as an example of institutionalized sexual slavery and emphasizes that it is one of the largest cases of human trafficking in the 20th century. It also goes on to say that estimates on the total number of victims vary, but most experts argue that hundreds of thousands of women were forced into these situations during Japanese occupation. This is the result of last month's public hearing, where we argued to the Education Board the need to include this issue of Japanese wartime sexual slavery. Members of the public are invited to comment on the draft until February, before the curriculum is finalized by the State Board of Education in May. The Japanese newspaper Sankei Shimbun reported on Monday that the Japanese government will make efforts to convince the board to either take out the content or reduce it. They are arguing that the issue doesn't qualify as slavery, saying that the women served as volunteers. Tokyo's refusal to claim responsibility is an ongoing source of conflict between Korea and Japan, as most of the victims were Korean. Seoul and the surviving victims are still seeking a formal apology and reparations from the Japanese government for the atrocities. Kwon jang Arirang News. Korea's health ministry has approved the establishment of the nation's first ever foreign-owned for-profit hospital in the southern resort island of Jeju. Now, the decision is stirring controversy as it will most definitely reshape the medical services landscape here in Korea. For a clear explanation of what the deal is here, Arirang News Kim Ji-yeon is live in the studio with me. Now, ji Korea is dominated by, um, I don't want to say non-profit, but medical centers that are not for-profit. Now, first of all, uh, help us distinguish the difference between for-profit hospitals and not for-profit hospitals. Well, for pro both the for-profit and non-profit hospitals are intended to generate earnings from their medical services, but for-profit hospitals are different from their non-profit counterparts in how they're managed and funded. Non-profit hospitals are publicly traded and have a board of directors to answer to like any other listed company. If they perform well, their shares go up and the value of the hospital improves, making shareholders 
doctors happy. So for-profit hospitals, they try to come up with various ways to attract patients, including premium services for those that can afford them. But it's difficult to find a listed hospital in Korea as 95% of local hospitals are not profit-oriented and that they allow any Korean national with public health insurance to access their medical services. The country currently allows the establishment of for-profit hospitals on Jeju Island and its eight economic zones. But since it's currently limited to these areas, some experts say that it's too premature to assess the overall impact it will have on the Korean medical sector in general. No, no, Chiana, but for, uh, you know, for the sake of argument, we assume that, you know, these for-profit hospitals are prevalent. Would it not improve uh, the quality of medical services provided? I mean, would there not be more premium services that are provided by these for-profit hospitals? Many like you believe so. One of the biggest advantage of these prevalence of for-profit hospitals is that it's expected to help improve the competitiveness of a country's medical service sector by raising the quantity and quality of medical staff of local hospitals in general. For example, in the U.S. where for-profit and non-profit hospitals coexist, the care a patient receives on average is about two to three times that of a Korean patient. A nurse at a profitable U.S. hospital takes care of four to five patients at one time on average, allowing more time for attentive care. In comparison, a nurse working in a hospital in Korea is responsible for seven to eight, sometimes up to ten patients at once. And most of the time, nurses in the U.S. are able to form bonds with the patients, um, giving them appropriate care until they're discharged. And now, uh, the downside or, you know, those opposed to this idea of for-profit hospitals in this country, I imagine would be that this would create a deeper divide between the haves and have-nots in access to premium services in the medical sector and ultimately really end up dismantling Korea's health insurance system. That's right. I agree with you. Well, the government's approval of a for-profit hospital last week has increased concerns that the quality of medical services of Koreans enjoy will be affected. Currently, the government provides public health care to every Korean citizen by collecting taxes proportionate to their earnings. This is in stark contrast to the medical system in the U.S., where patients have to pay a fortune to receive medical treatments that their insurance doesn't cover. And health insurance provided by private companies is not cheap. It can go up to 1,700 U.S. dollars a month for a household of four, depending on the company's risk assessment guidelines. And there are instances where hospitals deny patients from receiving treatment, even in life-threatening situations when they can't afford medical fees or insurance. Right. I mean, creating more medical jobs and I suppose transforming this country into a regional medical hub is definitely a plus. But, you know, before we move on any further in opening up to for-profit hospitals, it's definitely necessary that relevant policies and law are put in place first mm -hmm. to prevent such a you know, disaster from happening. Mm -hmm. All right, Gianna, great coverage. Thank you for that report. No sweat. Koreans surrounded on three sides by water have long enjoyed seafood and fish. Now, one of Koreans' most beloved fish includes the Alaskan pollock. We eat it as soup, stew, grilled, fried, and dried. Once a fisherman's biggest catch hauling 80,000 to 150,000 tons per year, the number has been on a steady decline and now faces near extinction in the East Sea. Why the disappearing act and are there efforts to bring them back? The Korean government's Pollock Revival Project, our news feature tonight. A saucy steak, boiling spicy stew, savory steamed dish, and soup to comfort your stomach. These are just some of Korea's winter specialties, all made with a fish known commonly as Alaskan Pollock. It's Korea's number one fish preferred by the general population. Here at Korea's biggest fisheries market in Noryangjin, Pollock's popularity was evident, in particular because the seasonal fish reaches its peak during December and January. 
But ironically, the pollock being sold here were all imported. It's been quite a while, actually, over a decade since the fish wasn't caught in Korea. They're all imported from Japan, Canada and Russia. It wasn't always like this. In the 1980s, pollock was one of the most abundant species living in the East Sea. However, the pollock catch began a drastic downslide in the 1990s, landing at near zero in 2007. The main reason is overfishing. If you look at data from the 1970s and 80s, fishing young pollock took up about 80 to 90 percent of the total weight caught. In headcount, it means Koreans ate around 10 times more young pollock than grown-up pollock. With the domestic supply virtually non-existent, fishing villages that depended on pollock catch to make a living were hit hard, and prices have become unstable. Russian pollock, which takes up around 90 percent of total imports, has decreased in quantity but increased in the price paid, meaning that the price per unit has soared. Amid growing concerns, the government rolled up its sleeves in 2014. The Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries in Gangwon-do province built a center dedicated to the revival of domestic pollock species. It's a relatively novel attempt to artificially farm pollock previously attempted only by Japan. If pollock is caught again in the East Sea, then we can replace the imported pollock with our own fish, thus raising Korean fishers' income levels. A pollock takes around three to four years to fully grow and be capable of spawning, but in Korea there was no adult pollock to begin the revival project. It was important to produce juvenile pollock to go about the revival project, which meant that we needed adult pollock to spawn. But with the seas almost depleted, it was difficult to find the fish. The project kicked off with a search for adult pollock, put on the wanted list with a reward of over 400 U.S. dollars. And it was the occasional catch in the fishermen's nets that cut the ribbon for the experiment. The fish succeeded in spawning and eggs hatched in February. For 10 months, some 35,000 young pollock were grown in the center to a size of 15 to 20 centimeters. Through the experiment, we've achieved growing for 10 months thousands of juvenile pollock of up to 20 centimeters that can actually be released into the sea. Finally, after two years of research, the long-awaited day arrived. The EC fell below 10 degrees Celsius, the ideal temperature for this cold current fish. 30 minutes away from the shore, 15,000 farmed pollock were released last Friday. The center aims to release over a million of farmed pollock every year starting from 2018 to eventually form a designated pollock fishing ground in the East Sea. As pollock instinctively returned to the place where it's first released, the center expects the juvenile fish to first head north in March when the water temperatures in the East Sea become warmer and come back in fall along with the cold current. In order to have as many pollock as possible returning, fishing in waters where the pollock was released is to remain prohibited for four years until 2019. In about two years, the released fish will grow fully. When pollock is caught in the East Sea, we'll run DNA tests to check whether the experiment had substantial impact. If many pollock are caught, then it's good for everyone. If the first ever pollock release succeeds, I believe that we'll soon be able to find as many pollock in our sea as we had before. Will domestic pollock be able to make a comeback and return to the Korean dining table? The government and the fishers are crossing their fingers for it to happen. But after all, only time will tell. We had a dusty day to kick off the new week here in Seoul, hoping that things will get clearer by tomorrow. Let's go live to our Chihon at the Weather Center. Now, Chihon, you know, I could feel it in my throat today. It was quite dusty. Right, right. But bad news, Gunyang. Unfortunately, the air quality will actually get worse tomorrow compared to today in the upper parts of the country, including here in Seoul. So for those with respiratory problems, be sure to have a mask with you when heading out tomorrow. In the meantime, a dry weather advisory remains in place for 
four consecutive days for some parts of Gangwon-do province, and tomorrow will be no exception. A chillier morning is expected here in Seoul tomorrow, but notice how afternoon temperatures will be way above the seasonal average, peaking to 8 degrees Celsius under partly sunny skies. On that note, let's move on to readings for other regions. Uh, daily low here in the capital will kick off at minus 1, Daejeon and Daegu 0, while Busan and Jeju will start out the their day at 6 and 8. Afternoon highs will be on the mild side, but skies will get cloudier as daily high in Daejeon will peak at 10, 9 for Daegu, Busan and Jeju will see a high of 14 and 15. Now, temperatures will remain relatively favorable this week, including on Christmas Eve and on the Christmas Day, but expect the mercury to plunge to negatives by the weekend. Well, that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. Well, uh, that's a beautiful place for you to go and spend some time uh, for the year's end with your friends and family. That is our broadcast on this Monday night. I'm Moon Gan Young. Thank you everyone for watching and we hope to see you right back here same time tomorrow on News Center. <laughs>